There's a single definition of success. If you look at yourself in a mirror in the evening and wonder if you disappoint the person you were at 18 right before people get corrupted by life. Let him or her be the only judge. Not your reputation, not your wealth, not your standing in the community, not the decorations on your lapel. If you do not feel ashamed, then you are successful. All other definitions of success are modern construction, fragile modern construction. <laughs> no, I'm laughing. The ancient Greeks' definition of success was to have had a heroic death. But as we live in a less martial society, even in Lebanon, we can adapt our definition of success as having taken a heroic route for the benefits of the collective, as narrowly or broadly defined as you want, so long as it's someone else. For example, secret societies have the rule of uomo donori. You're as good as what you do to other members. So virtue is inseparable from courage. So you had to take some risks, personal, financial, whatever, for the sake of others. That's success. That's honor. It can be helping the local municipality, for example. I'm giving a hint here. Or but the more micro, micro, the less abstract, the better. So success requires absence of fragility. I've seen billionaires terrified of journalists. Wealthy people who felt crushed because their brother-in-law got very rich. Academics with Nobel who were scared of comments on the web. The higher you go, the worse the fall. For almost all people I've met, external, not internal, success came with an increase in fragility and a heightened state of insecurity. The worst are those former something types with four-page CVs who, after leaving office and addicted to the attention of servile bureaucrats, find themselves discarded. It's as if you went home one evening to discover that someone suddenly emptied your house of all its furniture. Self-respect, on the other hand, is robust. That's the approach of the Stoic school which is, incidentally, a Phoenician movement. So if someone wonders, who are the Stoics? I'd say they're Buddhists with an attitude problem. Okay. Imagine someone very, very Lebanese and a Buddhist at the same time. That's a Stoic, the attitude problem. Okay. So I've seen robust people in my village, I'm Yun, who were proud of being, you know, local citizens, you know, liked by the community. They wake up happy and go to bed happy. Or Russian mathematicians who during the difficult post-Soviet period were proud of making $200 a month and did work that was officiated by 20 people and considered that showing was decoration or accepting awards, that was a sign of weakness and a lack of confidence in one's own contribution. And believe it or not, some wealthy people are robust, but you just don't hear about them because they're not socialized. They live next door and they drink baladi, not verb clico. Okay. Now a bit of my own history. I'm supposed to tell you something about my history, so let me try. Don't tell anyone but all the stuff you hear about philosophical ideas, okay, it's dressed up, okay. The real story, it, it all came from a gambling instinct. I can't get rid of it, it's a gambling instinct. So just imagine a compulsive gambler playing high priest. Actually, here now, now I'm dressed like a high priest. People don't like to believe it, but my education came from trading and risk taking with some help from school. 
I was lucky, I'm, I'm robust, I'm okay, but I'm insecure. <laughs> I was lucky to have a background to closer to that of a classical Mediterranean or a medieval European before universities became commoditized. My parents had an account with Librairie Antoine in Babdris at the time, so, and a big library, and they bought a lot of books, but they didn't read the books, so I, they needed someone to read the books. So I was the person, you know, who did the job, so they were happy with that. So, and also, so I started valuing erudition over other um, attributes, but at the same time, I realized that what you learn in school is very narrow, so it's a waste of time to focus too much on school. Don't tell anyone here, okay, anyway. So, I wanted initially to become a writer, and really, if your knowledge is limited to the what happens in a, what, what you study in a baccalaureate, Lebanese baccalaureate, you're not gonna go anywhere. So you need to be broader, and it takes time. So I skipped school most days, again, don't tell anyone, and, but read voraciously. And later, I find myself unable to concentrate on subjects that others imposed on me. So I separated schools for credentials from schools for one's own edification. So I drifted a bit with no focus and remained on page eight of the great Lebanese novel until age 23. So I was writing at one page per year. So you know, not gonna go very far with that. Then I got a break when I was in business school. I accidentally discovered probability theory and became obsessed with it. But as I said, it did not come from lofty philosophizing or scientific hunger, none of that. It was just the thrills and hormonal flush one gets while taking risks. That's it. A friend told me about complex derivatives and I decided to make a career in them. It was a combination of trading and complex mathematics. The field was new and uncharted and they were very, very difficult mathematically. So greed and fear were my teachers. I was like people with addictions who have a very, 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 very average or even below average, way below average intelligence. But suddenly, because they're drug addict, they find the most ingenious methods to get their drugs, okay? So when there was money on the line, I suddenly grew a special brain that I lost later, you know, when there's no money. So, so that's, and I'm still like that. So when there's a fire, you run very fast. So th that was my method. So again, don't tell anyone, all right? Don't tell them I'm a philo philosopher. <laughs> and anyway, and as a trader, the mathematics we used were very adapted to our problem, like a glove. So we were not like academics with a theory looking for an application. Applying math to practical problems was another business altogether. It meant a deep understanding of the problem before you start putting the equations. So I found getting a doctorate after 12 years of trading much, much easier than, than getting degrees. This, this is a random event, by the way, that was unpredicted. So, so I discovered along the way that the economist and social scientist were always, almost always, applying the wrong mathematics. And that became the theme of the black swan. Their statistical tools were not just wrong, they were outrageously wrong, and they still are. Their methods underestimated what we call tail events, those rare but consequential jumps, and they were too arrogant to accept it. This discovery allowed me to achieve financial independence in my 20s after the crash of 1987. You see, I'm very old. So I felt I had something to say in the way we use probability and how we think about it and how we manage uncertainty. Probability is a logic of science. It's a logic of philosophy. It touches on many subjects. Theology, philosophy, psychology, science, and the more mundane, more mundane engineering. Incidentally, probability was not born with Descartes and Fermat. It was born here, Al al-Musadafa, used to decrypt 
messages. So the past 30 years for me have been flaneuring across disciplines, bothering people along the way, pulling pranks on people who take themselves seriously, and finding what mistakes people made with probability. So you take a medical paper, for example, and I'm not a doctor, and you can make the person panic if you start asking him or her how they got their pee. They start panicking. So this is why it's a lot of fun. You can, make, you can terrorize people at conferences, so it's a lot of fun to be in probability. So that's good discipline. So the second break came to me after the crisis of 2008. Again, I felt vindicated. I had taken personal risks, and I did okay. But I made another discovery, the second discovery of my life. I discovered that I hated fame. I hated famous people. I hated caviar. I hated champagne, complicated food, expensive wine, and mostly people who comment on wine. All right. So I like meze with local Arab baladi. That's what I drink in New York, OK? And sabidish, squid ink, OK? Not complicated things. <laughs> Instead of having my preferences dictated by norms, that of magazines for rich people. So it be, my preferences became obvious to me one day when I was having dinner, I had dinner in a Michelin three-star restaurant with complicated people, complicated wine and small complicated dishes. And after that, I went to Nick's Pizza and ate 6.95, you know, the big thing of pizza for $6.95 and haven't had a single Michelin meal since. So, or anything with complex names or complex stuff. I'm particularly allergic to people who belong to the IAND, the International Association of Name Droppers. So after a year in the limelight, I went back to the seclusion of my library in Amun or New York, and I started a new career as a researcher doing technical work. So when I read my bio, I feel that it's that of another person because I just started a few years ago. And, and I still don't know where I'm going, where it's going to take me. So I hesitate to give advice. I describe my life. I hesitate to give advice. Why? Every single piece of advice I was given turned out to be wrong. Okay. And I'm glad I didn't follow them. I was told to focus. I never focused. I was told to never procrastinate. And it took me 20 years to write my first big book, The Black Swan. And it sold 3 million copies. So I wish I waited another 10. Okay. I was told to avoid putting fictional characters in my books, Nero Tulip, Fat Tony, Yevgenia Krasnova. So I got bored, you know, writing a book without fictional characters. So, you know, still I put, put them in. I was told to not insult the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And you know my hobby is to insult the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal. And they still write nice things about me. Okay, I was told to avoid lifting weights because when I had a back injury and I started lifting weights and my back has never been better since. Okay, so if I had to relive my life, I'd be even more stubborn and more uncompromising than I have ever been. Okay, so here I have to give you advice and I'm telling you don't listen to advice. Okay, so let me tell you what I think is robust because I practice it. Number one, do not read newspapers except uh, newspapers tomorrow about the ceremony here, okay? So do not follow the news in any way or form. To be convinced, go to the library and try to read last year's newspaper, okay? And that will convince you. You should go from the news to the, to the papers, not from the paper to uh, more papers. This is what, okay. Second thing, if something is nonsense, you say it, and you say it out loud. You'll be harmed a little bit, but be anti-fragile. In the long run, people who need to trust you will trust you. When I was still an obscure author, I walked out of a studio, um, Bloomberg Radio, because the interviewers was, they were saying nonsense, so I just walked out. People told me, you'll never have any coverage by Bloomberg ever again. I said, okay. Two years later, they had a cover story on me. Okay. So if you see nonsense, say it and say it loud. Every economist on the planet hates me, except, of course, those at AUB. All right. I suffered smear campaigns, but 
So I have now some advice to give you, other than advice to him to help me with, so it doesn't get too wet. <laughs> Number one, treat the doorman with a lot of respect. Okay, more than if you were the boss. The boss can go down, not the doorman. If something is boring, avoid it. Except, of course, taxes and visits to your mother-in-law. Okay, other than these, avoid everything boring. And there are a lot of rules in my book, so I'm going to end up with no no's. No, the things to avoid completely. Muscles without strength. Friendship without trust. Opinion without risk. Change without aesthetics. Age without values. Food without nourishment. Power without fairness. Facts without rigor, degrees without erudition, militarism without fortitude, progress without civilization, complication without depth, fluency without content, and most of all, religion without tolerance. Thank you.